Welcome to ZCast, everyone. I'm ZS Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here inside the AWS studio in the AWS Innovation Zone at MWC 2025. I'm here with Moon Hussein from uh, AWS. Uh, Moon, how are you doing? Doing well, ZS. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and what do you do at AWS? We're going to talk security, so. I'm in product management. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a leader in product management for the perimeter protection arm of security at AWS that encompasses a whole bunch of services uh, geared in protecting network and applications. Yeah, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, we're here at MWC. It's the uh, largest telecom show in the industry, right? Uh, any initial thoughts from the show? Uh, how, how's the show been for you? It's been great. Um, lots of conversations around AI. I uh, bet. Definitely, <laughs> definitely the big topic around in terms of the immersion of AI into security and how security affects AI as well. So lots of topics around that. Yeah, yeah. it's it's interesting that um, I, I think within not just the SP, the enterprise environment too, there's m more... Um, I guess there's more awareness of the role of security in AI. And we were talking about this before we started recording about the difference between security for AI and AI for security. One is how I secure my AI workloads, and the other one's how I use AI to improve security. Right. And it's been my thesis that you can't really do AI for security because the environment changes so fast unless you actually adopt security. No, you can't do security for AI unless you do AI for security. Yet, Your thoughts on that? Yeah. We're seeing different use cases on both. So for yeah. example, for the AI for security, what customers are looking for are ways to streamline the process, the entire workflow of security. The first thing is policy instantiation. Can they get some guidance around that? The second part is, can AI help in terms of weeding out the false positives as I go from my test networks to my production networks? And then the third piece is that I'm inundated with so many events. Can AI be used to correlate these and perform some mm. kind of temporal analysis of these events so that they're just much more actionable? Yeah, and uh, uh, and so, so that, that'll round us up and bring us back to your portfolio. So it's perimeter, perimeter protection, as you mentioned, that encompasses uh, a lot of different things. So can you go through that and tell me what's included in that? Because that's a pretty broad scope uh, of technology. It right? is a broad scope. Yeah. Um, if I was to break it down, there are two typical elements that we talk about. One is protection of the network, and the other one is the protection of applications. So starting with the protection of the network, customers typically tell us that they want capabilities for protecting ingress traffic, inbound traffic, egress traffic for IPs that are actually um, talking to nefarious IPs in the internet, and also VPC to VPC traffic, that internal lateral conversation, so you can do segmentation within the network. Um, the other thing on the network side is also the protection of DDoS. DDoS has evolved quite a bit, going from volumetric attacks to application-based mm. attacks. So that's another key right. concern. And we've got things like Shield Advanced, AWS Shield Advanced, to not only detect, but also protect from DDoS events. In terms of application protection, um, we're looking at customer signals where they have applications that are deployed in AWS that have connectivity to the outside world. So they need protection for those applications. So protection from what we know as the OS top 10, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, yeah. and also bot activity to reduce that traffic that's based on bot activity. Um, and then fraud protection as well, in terms of what do I do with scrapers, um, credential stuffing kind of attacks and things like that. So we've got a suite of products uh, under AWS uh, WAF, which is Web Application Firewall, that does some of the OS top 10 inspections, as well as the anti, um, you know, the anti-bot um, protection, as well as the, the fraud protection piece of it as well. Yeah, in fact, um, you, you've kind of answered this already. I was going to ask you about, the, you know, with you being in charge of perimeter protection, uh, the perimeter, of, of course, isn't as nearly well-defined as it used to be. Um, and, uh, in fact, a lot of people say the, the perimeter's gone or it's everywhere. And uh, how, how has that changed your thinking around perimeter protection? Um, it has changed. So, you know, what traditionally used to be based on certain parameters like IP addresses and things yeah. like that, that's become very ephemeral. So what we used to base our inspections on 
has to change. For example, if we're in uh, an EKS environment, are there other parameters that we can look at either than just port and the five tuple inspection that we normally do? So the perimeter is definitely dissolved. So we need to have different types of techniques and mechanisms by which we can characterize the traffic that we're looking at as opposed to the traditional mechanics that were done with, you know, the traditional definition of perimeter. Yeah, and I suppose the threat actors have already evolved, right? When you talked about DDoS now being moving away from the volumetric to app focused, that's yeah. a good example of that. That's a great example yeah, yeah. of that. And you know, that also lends itself to a lot of challenges. Like when you're dealing with L3, L4 attacks on the DDoS side, you've got volumetric attacks that are out there in the open. I mean, lots of connections, you know, they're highly visible. But when you've got attackers that are packing in multiple HTTP requests in a packet, there's now below the radar uh, with these L7 attacks, which are much harder to, de to, to detect. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Now, uh, your, your technology is also used to protect the internal AWS network as well, right? Correct. Yeah, and so knowing that, um, it would seem that that gives you kind of a unique vantage point uh, to, you know, the the evolution of security, and then you can turn around and make that customer face. Is that correct? That's that's yeah, correct. Yeah. That's the, you bring up a great point. So um, there are benefits in terms of protecting the infrastructure. There are certain types of insights that you can discern. So, for example, we have things like. Um, digital decoys and honeypots across the world. And with that, we understand what the attackers are doing out there in terms of the types of attacks, the anatomies of the attacks, so we can generate threat intel from them. The other thing that we can get is um, the typical IP reputation analysis of what we see, so we can put that into a certain repository of bad IPs and then take all of that intelligence and then transfer that into what we refer to as AMRs or AWS managed rules that go into our mm. firewalls, our web application firewalls and so on and so forth. Yeah, and actually so without the internal knowledge of the internal network, building that would actually be a very long uh, um, really error-prone process too. I would it's think. an yeah, error-prone yeah, yeah. process, it's a long process, and quite frankly, it's not something that people can do. Yeah. Without that level of intel, you have to have that intel to correlate yeah. it, but if you don't have that intel, there's not much you can do. But um, that, in, it, in and of itself, is a key component of what goes into our rules. The fact that we have that intelligence, so we can take what we do for the infrastructure and convert it to capabilities on our hosted platform that customers can leverage. Okay, and and you know one of the, the changes I've seen from AWS uh, over the last few years, from a go-to-market perspective, is a lot more interoperability between services. Right now, when that happens, there's also security issues that come up too. Right. So, yep. how have you been thinking about that, and how you use your products to help with that? Absolutely. Well, it's if you talk to the CISOs of large customers, what you will find is that they have dozens of security services on their network. They're both AWS services yeah. as well as third party well, services. Well, dozens is generous. It's, you, it's more than I've, that. Yeah. I've seen up <laughs> yeah. to 60 yeah. in, a, in an organization. Yeah. So what happens there is that it becomes very fragmented. Fragmented from the standpoint of policy instantiation all the way down the workflow of dealing mm -hmm. with events that are generated from the policies. So as a result, interoperability is an imperative. It just has to happen. Customers are telling us that they don't want these um, different types of services working in silos. They want a cohesive type of architecture. So in that, we've done integrations uh, within our own services. So for example, um, our WAF engines are integrated with CloudFront. So we've got these one-click integrations with our front doors. Uh, we've got integration with our product suite with um, GuardDuty to take okay. events and then funnel it into GuardDuty. And then also with our third parties as well. Uh, we've got a pretty robust robust um, um, set of services that are available on AWS Marketplace that have interactions with our own services. We've got API interactions with third-party services. And then lastly, these third-party services are also interoperating with guard duty to have that aggregate view of things that are happening in the environment. Yeah, and talk about the third-party interactions a, a little more, because I think, um, uh, you know, I think some people would look at some of those as competitors, and 
you know, typically that's not a, uh, you know, you never want to do business with competitors. But more and more, I think security requires an ecosystem approach. It does. And, uh, you know, and I think AWS has always done a good job of embracing third parties, no matter what the type of service. But, it does. Yeah, but, yeah. but talk about the philosophy there and yeah. why you do that. I think the philosophy is threefold. Uh, first of all, from the augmentation of capabilities, yes, we've got a lot of services and security services at AWS, but we don't have all the services. Yeah. So the ability to augment in areas where we don't play, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is our ability to correlate with other services that third, provide, third party providers provide as well to make our insights that much richer. Yeah. And then the third piece of this puzzle is the fact that customers are deploying in a very diverse environment. So for example, they've got cloud deployments, multi-cloud deployments, on-prem deployments. So what can we do to take our cloud intelligence and then combine it with other players in the market that perhaps are focused on the on-prem side of things? Yeah, and, uh, and uh, I would think that too, that the more AI-driven security becomes, the more important uh, the data becomes, which would then translate into the need for third parties to have a bigger data set so you see more. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah. The more data you have, the more you see, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, platformization has been a pretty interesting topic in security circles for a while. Um, I, I think the, you know, maybe five years ago was a bit of a solution looking for a problem, but I think more and more CISOs now understand that trying to do best to breed everywhere doesn't actually lead to best in class threat protection. So, have you seen? Uh, an increased interest in this concept of, uh, of security platform where you're buying, um, I'm not saying everything from one vendor, vendor, but certainly from a policy perspective, manageability perspective, it makes it easier. Right? I, I would say that changes depending on the market segment. When you're dealing with the smaller customers, they basically want to see everything sort of a all in one single package. Um, it's much easier for them to manage. When you get to the mid-tier as well as the larger customers, they tend to use best of breed, which is usually a combination of multiple vendors. Yeah. So it's to our earlier point, it's very critical that you have that level of integration as you go up market and you deal with um, customers wanting more out of the solution and going at um, looking at best of breed uh, vendors and trying to sort of cobble them together. So the more that we can do to automate that process, the better it so is. So you can actually let customers have the benefit of a platform even though they want to use best of breed. Correct. Yeah, Correct. that's interesting. Yeah, now when I look at these services, a lot of them seem enterprise focused. What's the relevancy to service providers? So there's a lot of relevancy to service providers. We've got a lot of service provider customers. When I speak to them, they talk about two unique use cases. The first use case is how do I protect my own environment, like the service provider infrastructure. Yeah. The second use case is what can you deliver that I can deliver to my end customers as value added services. So let's talk about the first one first. So in the first one, customers are looking for typical DDoS protection of the infrastructure of their service provider as well. But the difference, the nuance relative to enterprise customers is the scale at which we need to provide it. So the fact that we can, you know, um, you know, rely on resiliency and um, those types of cap disaster recovery capabilities that AWS has, and we can deal with the scale that we can support, our ability to support large-scale DDoS activities is that much better as a result. The second thing they're asking for is, you know, they have to pay transit costs to all of this traffic. Yeah. So if you've got bot management and you're able to reduce the traffic volume and eliminate all that bot traffic, well, we can use our bot capabilities to do that for these service providers. The third piece is that they don't want any implications from a compliance standpoint of internal IP addresses connecting with nefarious sources out on the internet. So all of the firewalling techniques that we have to monitor egress traffic is another capability that we can provide to the service provider for protecting their own infrastructure. Now the second piece is how do we protect this infrastructure of their customers? So the signals that we're getting is that, you know, they want the ability to ensure that their customer data does not commingle uh, for compliance reasons. So the fact that we've got multi-tenancy in our cloud infrastructure is very conducive to that. The other thing is related to billing. They want to ensure that 
the customer is only billed for the types of services that they're using. <laughs> so the whole pay-as-you-go mentality yeah. fits in very well in that environment. The third piece we've already discussed, it's a very heterogeneous environment that their customers are using. So our ability to work with our marketplace um, vendors to integrate with our solutions is absolutely key. And then the final piece is that when they offer these services to their customers, they need to make sure that it's in a cloud environment, a multi-cloud environment, and the on-prem environment. So our ability to utilize things like AWS Outpost to bring security services down to the uh, on-prem level is another key capability that they're looking at. And do you see this being something that they can turn around and make a revenue generating service? There are service providers yeah. who are doing that today. And um, you know, um, depending on the geographies, depending on the types of customers, they have different requirements. But from a scale perspective, a resilience perspective, the cloud advantages, these are all things that work in our favor. See, in terms see of, the importance yeah. of that is as I've walked around the show floor and I've talked to the service providers, We've been talking about te teleco transformation at the show for as long as I've been coming to the show, right? And at the end of the day, when I ask what their transformation initiatives are, there's two sides to the coin. There's cost savings, bringing down the operational savings, and then there's gener revenue generating services. But they always seem to focus on the cost savings. Yep. And I think there's a lack of awareness of what those revenue generating services are. And so it seems like the way you're approaching it your value prop to the service providers is you can lower the cost of operations by simplifying security. Yep. Right. You can make them more secure. Right. Right. Um, and but then they can also take the same security tools and make them customer facing, giving them an extra service to sell along with the transport. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so they have these value added services yeah. as well, where they will help you like. Um, Analyze the events, they will help you take response actions and things like that. So at the baseline, we're providing the service and then they can uh, sort of tack on with their value added services. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I think, in fact, that's a really important point, I think, for the service fighters to understand is um, uh, I, I think in this AI era, security becomes a low hanging fruit opportunity for them to add services on. And so this mythical hunt we've been on for, you know, for the better part of a decade of additional services, I think security really does, um, you know, uh, put that in the crosshairs. I so, agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, all right. Anything else you want to add? No, it's been great. It's yeah. been great chatting with you and uh, look forward to seeing you here next year as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate the time and it was great and getting caught up with what you run in security. So uh, on behalf of Moon Hussein from AWS, I'm Zia Scaravallo from ZK Richardson. Thanks for watching. Uh, hit the like button and uh, hit the subscribe button as well. And uh, I'll see you next time on the next episode of ZCast. Thanks, Moon.